We, we can't imagine that we are immune to the dangers of false teachers who infiltrate the church, immune to the influences of a toxic culture. We would be very, very naive to think that. And so we need to ask, are we as a church, are we individually, are we exercising proper discernment? Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today we're continuing a message that we began last time from the book of Titus, where we began to look at the dangers all around us. And uh, Jonathan, as you said, one of the things that we need to do, both as a church and as individuals, is to make sure that we're exercising proper discernment. But how would we actually know if we are? Well, I think if we ask the Apostle Paul that question, he would begin his answer by saying, you need to know the truth which is set down in the Scriptures. So if you want to be able to discern truth from error, legitimate, authentic Christian teaching from falsehood, and there's plenty of falsehood around the place, of course, you need to know the Bible, because God has given us his word that we might know him and no truth. I think that's the starting place. But I think if if we allowed Paul to continue, as he does in the letter to Titus, what he will also highlight for us is the importance of being part of a church where there is a godly and discerning leadership and eldership. And, and if we're just go-it-alone Christians trying to find our way in the world, we are vulnerable. We need to be part of a church where there is is faithful teaching and godly leadership. And, and that's a protection for us. That's God's design for the believer. Well, join us in God's Word as we look at this further. We're in the book of Titus, as you just heard, verses uh, 10 through 16 of chapter 1 is where we're going to be camping out today. So join us there as we continue Dangers All Around. Here is Jonathan. These people who Paul says are insubordinate, they are empty talkers and deceivers. They have, if you like, kind of the gift of the gab. <laughs> They're good at presenting a plausible case. They're very, very persuasive. These are compelling people to listen to. People gather around them. Uh, people get drawn into what they're saying. People find them impressive on some kind of level. It's hard to refute their arguments. They're probably clever. They're crafty in the way they put things. But their smooth words can actually be very, very deceptive. They're not speaking truth. Now, clearly, they're not a million miles away from the truth. After all, people aren't stupid. And if the teaching is outright heresy, hopefully fewer people are going to buy into it. No, these people are probably peddling half-truths and partial truths, which is always far more dangerous than outright lies and overt heresy. That's certainly what was going on with this particular group who were of the circumcision party. In all likelihood, they were probably making really quite a plausible presentation. In all likelihood, they were saying, you know, it is wonderful to trust in Jesus the Messiah. Very, very good to follow him. It, it's wonderful, isn't it, that he died on the cross to save you. Obviously, trusting in Jesus, that's essential. It's a very, very good thing. But to be saved at the end, you know, you need to follow him. And, of course, you need to keep the Old Testament law, at least key parts of it. You know, you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the, the purity laws, maybe the dietary laws. There's a little list here. I've got a little list for you of things you need to do if you're ultimately going to be saved at the final day. Trust in Jesus and do these things. Get circumcised and you will be saved. It starts out sounding okay but it ends up denying the gospel. It ends up denying the gospel of justification by faith and faith alone. In the end, it is a message of faith plus works. It is a different gospel. It is a false message. Now, I don't know that that particular version of a false gospel is very prevalent just at the moment, the circumcision message, but there are plenty of variants on the theme current in our day. Certainly, the idea of adding requirements to the gospel, that never goes away. It may not be, you know, trust in Jesus and get circumcised to be saved. It might be, you know, trust in Jesus and give away this much money, and then you're going to be okay. It, or, or it might be, you know, trust in Jesus, but then serve in these particular ways in our ministry that we tell you you have to serve, and then you'll probably be okay. Or, you know, trust in Jesus and then follow this particular model of child rearing or child education or how you manage your home or something like that, and then you're going to be on the spiritual inside track. You're going to be okay. Trust in Jesus and then do this or the other. It's faith plus works. And that kind of distortion of the gospel is always around. But there are other types of distorted teaching in circulation at the present 
time, other types of false teaching. You know, there is this huge wave, this deluge of health and wealth teaching prosperity gospel that has gripped millions of people around the world and is very, very prevalent. You know, this basic idea, and you'll encounter it on TV or wherever, yeah, this basic idea that if you give financially to a particular ministry, you are going to encounter material blessing of some kind, either wealth or physical healing or something else, as a kind of reward and many people are duped into handing over money to corrupt teachers on that kind of basis. People who teach, verse 11, for shameful gain. In our society here in Canada and the West, many churches are crumbling under pressure at the present time to accommodate the prevailing social views on matters surrounding sexuality. I think we're seeing that all the time. Churches, denominations just abandoning the Bible's teaching to avoid offense and to fit in it's happening all the time. Then there's the concept of God's judgment for sin and the idea of hell. Many teachers are throwing that over because it's so unpalatable to many, so upsetting, so unpopular, so offensive. And churches that are traditionally Bible-believing and evangelical are compromising on these matters. Many people are being taken in. You see, false teaching, it, it hasn't gone away. And false teachers haven't disappeared, but they must, verse 11, be silenced. And that takes us back then to the godly elders of character and conviction that we thought about last time. The, these elders need to be ready to take active steps to protect the church, to silence these ungodly influencers. They need to be silenced because people like this can cause immense trouble. That was the case in Crete. They were upsetting whole families or whole households, and that could be family units or even house churches. They are upsetting them by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Now, that shameful gain could be the gain of money, as we spoke about just a moment ago, or it could be the promotion of another self-serving agenda, you know, bursting, uh, boosting rather their own personal reputation, flattering their ego by building a following, a kind of narcissism, or it could be about sowing discord, driving a wedge through the fellowship, seeking to break off a, a faction. Whatever the agenda is, whatever the shameful gain, it is shameful. And the elders need to be on the lookout. They need to be ready to do that unpopular, painful work of silencing such people, putting a stop to their activity. And that takes courage, doesn't it? But how very, very necessary that is. Now, we might at this point pause and just ask why. <laughs> you know, why this obsessive concern with sound teaching and with shutting down the, the false teaching? Why not just leave it be and let people form their own opinions and kind of self-regulate in this? You might be actually listening in here as someone who is, is not a Christian. You're just trying to figure things out, get, get a sense of what it is we're about here. And perhaps you're slightly rolling your eyes at the thought of these Bible people getting so upset at the thought of some alternative ideas doing the rounds. Why not just live and let live? I mean, come on, relax a little bit here. Well, the reason this matters, the reason Paul cares, and the reason we care, it's simply this. False teaching is deception, verse 10. False teaching upsets people in their faith, verse 11. Whole households, whole house churches are being upset here, being disturbed in the foundations of their faith. And Paul knows, and we know, that nothing matters more than a person's faith in Jesus Christ. There's nothing more precious. The very best thing we can do for anyone is to help them trust in Jesus and find life in his name, life eternal. And the worst thing we could ever do to harm someone is to disturb a believer's faith in Jesus or to allow someone else to disturb it. Eternity rests on true gospel faith. This isn't, you know, about personal preference or a kind of lifestyle choice. This is about heaven and hell. This is about eternal gain and eternal loss. This is about joy, and this is about suffering. It is about life, and it's about death. Nothing matters more than this. And so Paul says, going back to the false ungodly teachers, these insubordinate people, such people must be silenced. The church is at risk from ungodly false teachers. It, it's at risk next from a toxic culture, and that's verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Cities and communities 
do develop their own character and their own reputation over time, and some generate a bad name for themselves that they find hard to shake. The evangelist Billy Graham once famously likened the city of New York to Sodom and Gomorrah, I think that's probably back in the 1950s, expressing his hesitation to attempt evangelistic meetings in such a tough environment. Las Vegas, it's almost universally known, isn't it, as Sin City. And the validity of the name is rarely disputed even by those who enjoy visiting there. In the ancient world, the island of Crete was notorious for its low standards of ethics and of conduct. A source from the third century BC says this, and I quote, Cretans are thieves from way back, pirates. They never think along legal lines. In fact, in the ancient world, the word Cretanize meant to lie. It was, a, it was a kind of shorthand, a colloquial term for lying. If you acted like a Cretan, it meant to be dishonest. And of course, then there is the prophetic saying that Paul quotes here in the passage, which evidently originates with a man named Epimenides from the 6th or 7th century BC. It affirms just how bad the island's reputation had been and for how very long it had been bad. Now, this was the culture into which this young church was planted. This was the world in which these young believers were living and developing. You know, it was just normal to lie and to deceive. You, could, you couldn't expect for sellers in the marketplace to use accurate weights and measures. It was all slanted. You, you couldn't anticipate a, a person in business to actually keep their word. You would always be on guard for fraud, for swindling, for being taken for a bit of a ride. It was a culture of lies. It was a culture marked by evil and beastly behavior, not dignity of conduct, respect for persons, civility, order. I guess it was probably fairly common to see drunks in the street, to observe people overindulging in food, practicing gluttony with little embarrassment. And all that was acceptable. All that was seen as normal. That was the culture in which these young believers were learning what it meant to follow Christ, and it was toxic. It was the spiritual equivalent of trying to raise a family in a town where the water supply was poisoned or a town where a nuclear disaster had contaminated the ground. The environment itself was toxic to spiritual health and vitality. Now, Crete was notorious, but it was hardly unique. We actually see elements of all these things in our culture today, lying, dishonesty. We all know that we have to watch our back in the marketplace. We all know we have to be on the lookout in transactions and relationships. It's so easy to be deceived and defrauded. We're now entirely accustomed, aren't we, to picking up the telephone and expecting that the caller on the other end will be there to deceive us, to swindle us. Phone scams are so common that many of us are just cutting the phone line altogether. A landline is now more of a headache than it's worth. It's shameless, but it's so common. It's now unremarkable. Evil, beastly behavior. We only need to look on the news and read reports of gun violence in our communities, of lewd behavior, of gross immorality, laziness, gluttony. Those things have hardly disappeared, have they? Crete was a toxic culture, and in many ways, ours is too. I don't think I need to do too much work to convince you of that. I think we know. A little while ago, a, a picture did the round in media and online of a copperhead snake, a venomous pit viper that was lying atop a bed of dry leaves. And the brown pattern of the snake's skin and the leaves, the color and the pattern blended so perfectly that the snake was nearly impossible to spot. You could stare at the picture for quite a long time and not see the snake at all. But of course, its blending with its surroundings didn't make it any less dangerous. In fact, you were more likely to tread on it and be bitten by it because it blended in so well. The cultural backdrop of Crete was of such a murky color that these false teachers blended right in. The snakes in the grass were practically invisible. And the church wasn't ready to spot them. Probably the church was far too much like the culture too. It was blending. And so the danger was very, very real. And the danger, I think, remains just the same today. A toxic culture, a murky background, a church at risk. This is Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Glad you've tuned in today. We're going to pause right here, but we're going to get back to this message, Dangers All Around, in just a moment as we continue our series, Transformed by Truth. Well, I want to let you know just briefly that Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported broadcast. We're able to keep this program on this station because of your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called How Church Can Change Your Life. It answers 10 of the most common questions you may have about the church. And again, we'd love to send you a copy as our way of saying thanks for your support. 
If you want to find out more about this book and give your gift, then you can simply come to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. Added to the dangers posed by false teachers in a toxic culture is the risk posed finally by an undiscerning flock. Verse 13. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Here Paul seems to be turning his attention to people within the church who are listening to the false teachers, listening to their myths and their erroneous commands, and he tells Titus how to handle the situation. He is to rebuke them sharply. The present situation doesn't call for a gentle and a measured word of response. It actually calls for a sharp rebuke. And, and, and at this point, we kind of say, hey, now, Paul, you know, that's not very pastoral. We want soft words and gentle speech. We want, you know, an arm around the shoulder, kind encouragement, affirmation, comfort even. But a sharp rebuke, that's not what we're really looking for, Paul. But Paul insists this is exactly what's needed. And here's why. Some within the church family are actually listening to these false teachers, to people, verse 14, who have turned away from the truth, they are influenced enough by the culture that they don't recognize the ungodly teachers for who they actually are. They don't see what's really going on here. They haven't noticed the unpleasant behavior. They haven't recognized the false teaching. They have been thoroughly undiscerning. And Paul has very, very good reason to be concerned. He sees that what is at stake, verse 13, is the very faith of the flock. He wants them, his longing for them is that they should be sound in the faith, not following the teaching of those who turn away from the truth, verse 14. He, he cares about this because the end result of following false teaching is spiritual ruin. And here I think Paul has in view the false teachers and all who follow them. Look where this leads in verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure but both their minds and consciences are defiled. Paul has in mind here the particular heresy of the circumcision party. They dealt, as you remember, in Old Testament law, and the idea that certain things under the law were either pure or impure on a kind of ceremonial level. And he's saying that those who have been made truly pure by the gospel of Jesus Christ, they don't need to worry now about which foods are, or objects are ceremonially pure or impure according to religious law. No, all of that is kind of out the window now because of Jesus and his fulfillment of the law. It's all been fulfilled through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The Christian is now free of all that. But if you buy into the myths of the false teachers, suddenly you're in the trap of worrying about these things again because you don't have the freedom of the gospel the freedom of knowing that Jesus has made you clean by his blood. He set you free through his death. People who have bought into the lie have defiled minds and consciences now because they've rejected the only message that will make them truly clean, the message of the gospel. And so comes this terrible verdict, and it's quite arresting, verse 16, they, the ungodly teachers and all who follow them in their error, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Ungodly false teachers who peddle lies from bad motives, the people who kind of undiscerningly follow them, they close the door on the gospel, they deny God by their behavior, and they demonstrate that they do not truly belong to him. And at this point, Paul, he just doesn't hold back. He doesn't say, you know, teachers like this and their followers, they're sadly a little bit misdirected, a little, you know, misguided. Regrettably, they are slightly confused. No, no, that's not what he says. Claiming to know God, but turning away from him in life and in doctrine, this is an ugly thing. Teachers like this and the disciples are detestable, disobedient, and that takes us back to the essence of sin once more. This is an ugly insubordination. They are unfit for any good work. There's not a kind of middle ground here where we find, you know, a quiet role in the church for people like this. Perhaps, you know, a, a lower profile role, but we, we just smooth it all over. We, we take them perhaps out of teaching Sunday school and we get them to help with some administration in the back office. Oh, no, 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 there's not a way to sugarcoat this. 
gospel denial by doctrine and life. It renders teacher and disciple alike useless for the work of the gospel. And remember, the stakes are very, very high here. Paul's message, we saw verse 2, it holds out the hope of eternal life. He will tell us later, chapter 2 and verse 11, that the grace of God in Jesus brings salvation to people. This isn't something that we trifle with. The gospel deals with issues of eternal importance, of eternal significance. And so seeing things with this clarity, Paul feels the urgency. This isn't a moment for quiet words, soft speech. This is danger. This is a crisis. This is a time for sharp rebuke. Now, at this point, we've got to kind of stand back and ask some hard questions. We, we can't imagine that we are immune to the dangers of false teachers who infiltrate the church, immune to the influences of a toxic culture. We would be very, very naive to think that. And so we need to ask, are we as a church, are we individually, are we exercising proper discernment, the discernment that is actually needed and called for? When impressive-sounding teaching comes along, when impressive-sounding teachers come along, smooth talkers, Perhaps teachers who are a little bit kind of edgy, maybe a little unconventional, a little bit rebellious, and they capture our attention. How careful are we being to check their message, to look at their lives? You see, the sobering thing is that the people at Crete had Paul's agent there. They had Titus in their midst. They had the apostolic message from the apostolic agent but they were drawn, many of them, to the false teachers instead. That's the shock here in the passage. They were ready to obey the commands, Paul tells us, of the infiltrators. It seems absurd, but it was actually happening. Are we checking what we are hearing against the apostolic message? Let me ask you, are you careful about the teaching you consume online, on radio, on TV, on podcasts? Do you give careful consideration to it? To see if the speaker is of good reputation, of good character from all you know, if the message lines up with apostolic truth? The main protection Paul wanted to set up at Crete was a godly eldership, you remember that, from last week, who could shield the church from teaching like this. And so our greatest protection in these things is to be part of a church with a godly eldership. And let me, let me ask, is that your particular situation? Or are you kind of floating, maybe visiting, listening in as a kind of sole agent, flitting from teacher to teacher, from church to church? Be careful if that's what you're doing. Because the leadership structure of elders in the local church is there for your protection. Each one of us needs to be part of a healthy, well-led, biblically-led local church. If you're new to Christian things, if you're exploring Christian things, ultimately, this is where you need to land, in the safety of a biblically structured local church. And for those of us within the local church, can I say how important it is to take seriously the protection of the elders over the teaching of the church? Not to kind of brush that aside when there is a choice as to whether a resource would be used or a speaker would be welcomed, when there is direction from the elders on a matter of doctrine. It could be easy to dismiss their direction as, you know, a little bit narrow-minded. Uh, we know they're a little bit fussy. They're a little bit restrictive. Nice guys, but a bit judgmental. Clearly at Crete, not everyone was actually willing to listen to Titus. But there is safety within the local church and under the eldership, the leadership that God has provided. Are you being discerning in that way, and am I? The perils are very real, false teachers, a toxic culture. The stakes, they're very, very high. It is a matter of truth and deception, of purity and defilement before God. It is a matter of faith and of loss. It is a matter even of life and of death. May God make us discerning and keep us safe, sound in the faith, grounded in the truth. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a helpful message today, taking a look at some of the key dangers facing the church both then and now. If you want to go back and listen to this message, you can always do that by coming to our website. It is EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. You can also listen if you have the Encounter the Truth app. That's a great way to listen on the go whenever it fits your schedule. 
Now, you can find the app by going to your favorite app store and simply searching for Encounter the Truth. Again, just look for Encounter the Truth at your favorite app store. Well, thanks for listening today. I also want to say thanks to our producer, Mark Breda. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Hope you'll join us next time for Encounter the Truth.